It's Wednesday, August 3rd. From inside the WTOP newsroom, this is the DMV Download, brought to you by the men and women of Steamfitters Local 602. Get an estimate and learn more at steamfitters-602.org. Today, there's movement in the debate over who owns the road, cyclists, pedestrians, or drivers. Most reasonable people will say we can share, but DC is taking a step toward making its streets safer for those who are not on four wheels, as lawmakers propose we do away with right on red, among other changes. But will that really get DC closer to its Vision Zero goal? We talk about it with Jeremiah Lowry from the Washington Area Bicyclists Association. Last year, we've had the most traffic deaths since Vision Zero became a policy. So we're failing. So what does a safer city for pedestrians and cyclists look like? And how might we get there? We talked to an urban design professor at Virginia Tech. This doesn't mean that there is a, it's a war on cars, but what's going on is that we are sort of taking back some of these huge subsidies and advantages that drivers have gotten over time. Thanks for joining us. I'm Megan Cloherty. And I'm Luke Garrett. A change could be coming to D.C. streets, including a potential ban on right on reds for vehicles. This would happen if legislation proposed by a council member, Mary Che, is approved as is. The bill comes after three cyclists died on city streets last month. They are the latest victims of what's become a deadly trend. Since 2015, the district has seen a 40 percent rise in traffic deaths. The Safer Streets Amendment Act would change some traffic laws for drivers and allow cyclists to roll through stop signs, among other changes. Joining us now to talk about it is Jeremiah Lowry, who is the advocacy director with the Washington Area Bicyclist Association. Jeremiah, thanks for joining us on Zoom. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for covering this issue. So, Jeremiah, let's start with this legislation. Um, What stands out to you in it as a safety measure that cyclists are going to appreciate or actually does make them safer? Well, we're really excited about this banning right turn on red, you know, you can see it in my smile. (laughs) You know, we think it will lead to less traffic crashes and also fatalities in D.C. You know, right now you have cyclists and pedestrians as well who are scared to death. You know, they got the green light. So oftentimes they think, okay, I got the green light. It's good to go. I'm good to cross the crosswalk Mm -hmm. and, and go across the street. But oftentimes, like, you have that car coming around the corner that they don't see that could be a potential danger to their lives, you know? And so, you know, in my own personal experience, the majority of times that I've almost gotten hit by a car have occurred during when a car has been turning right on red. And you know? I hate it. This I hate will... it being like the, the cars versus the bikes, Jeremiah. Like, I kind of feel like it, it ends up being that way a lot. But there was a huge uh, protest that you guys had outside of City Hall last week, um, you know, questioning Vision Zero and questioning how how committed the city is to this plan. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Tell us about that protest and and why. Why you guys were out there. So we adopted Vision Zero in 2015. We adopted Vision Zero as a policy for the D.C. government. And since since we adopted it as a goal. Traffic fatalities have only gone up. Last year, in 2021, we've had the most traffic deaths since Vision Zero became a policy, you know, in D.C. So if this is our goal, if our aim and our goal, if our, the district government's goal is to end traffic deaths and fatalities, we're failing. We're failing our goal, right? Because the goal is zero. Uh, and each person who unfortunately loses their life is, is a child that, will never be able to grow up. Someone will never see their, their loved ones and their friends again. You know, so these are lives that are, are being impacted and, and family members are being impacted forever because of uh, traffic violence. We protested because we saying, hey, look, you're failing. You're failing at your own policies. You know, your own goals and aims are, are not being achieved and you need to do something different. Whether looking at looking at legislation, looking at the budget, You need to do something different to make our roads safer for all uh, users. Mm -hmm. Mm. And zooming out here, can you kind of give us an idea of how many people are really cycling and biking around the D.C. area? For some of our listeners who, you know, may not commute on a bike, um, what is that community like? Well, I mean, it's it's uh, it's a good amount. You know, I would say about (laughs) 10, almost like 10 percent of the population in D.C. bikes in some form or another. But I will say, you know, people bike for different reasons. You know, you look at during uh, COVID when, you know, things were shut down, there was less things to do. People were biking more. 
you know, because people are just finding it as, as, as a safer, as a non-crowded way to commute. And with that, boom, and the number of residents who are biking, we're asking the district government, like, we need, like, the infrastructure mm. to account for that. Right. You know, give people safe lanes to bike in the city and to move about in the city. So. I mean, I, I know you're a biker, but in your opinion, is it safe to bike in D.C.? We were sharing stories while we were about to uh, do this interview, and I used to bike to work for a very short period of time. And, you know, I'm not the greatest biker, but I'm okay. And even on the neighborhood streets, I kind of be like, I'm a little nervous as you're passing me by, you know, so I can't imagine the guys who are out there on Connecticut Avenue on Massachusetts on the, like the big streets, Georgia Avenue. Do you think it's a safe thing to do? I mean, until this legislation's put through? You know, that's a good question, you know, and I get asked that quite a bit from people who ask me, you know, this is my first, I want a bike, but now like I'm reading the news and, I, mm-hmm. and I'm right. terrified. I don't know if I want to like do it. I'm gonna stick to my car. And I will say the concerns are valid. You know, the concerns are valid because if you're not an experienced biker, it is, it is kind of scary out there. I would encourage everyone, you know, Wava offers free, but you know, learn to ride classes. I would encourage everyone if you're starting to bike for the first time, like maybe try the trails. But I don't, again, I don't blame them for feeling that way. Anyone who, who feels as though they're terrified to bike, you know, I don't blame them. I blame I blame the government for not providing them the uh, safe lanes that they need in order to feel safe and comfortable when commuting. Mm. And if you could, Jeremiah, can you kind of give us a vision into what you and Waba really wants for D.C. in the future? Does that look like bike lanes on every street? Does that look like all bike dedicated lanes on a whole street, like only Mm -hmm. bike streets? I mean, what, what does that really look like? Absolutely. Some some people who don't like biking, they will say, well, why would want bike lanes on every single street? You know, they even want them down our alleyways. <laughs> <laughs> we, we understand, you know, from an engineering perspective, you won't have bike lanes on every single street in Washington, D.C. I think one thing we're looking for is a connected network, mm. right? So it doesn't have to be on every street, but our idea is you want to get from point A to point B in the city, you should be able to go through, be able to do that through a connected network mm-hmm. of protected bike lanes. Maybe expanding the sidewalk, you know, a little bit, giving people space to walk and stuff of that nature. There are different traffic calming measures you can put on the street without putting a protected bike lane, right? Mm-hmm. Some speed humps or stuff, something of that nature. You know, Just to slow, slow cars down. down. Yeah. Last question for me is, do you know, I mean, obviously you guys are the Washington area. We're not just talking about D.C. when when you're looking at um, safety improvements that can be made. Is there another project or another, you know, uh, suburb of D.C. that's doing something interesting in your mind that, you know, other places can look to or maybe even D.C. could look to? Um, I think uh, you look at um, Crystal City, you know, to have the Crystal City Bike Network. You know, um, Montgomery County is developing uh, network plan you know i think i like the fact that like some of these cities and places are looking at it from a network perspective as opposed to let's build one bike lane that goes to nowhere right Mm. so montgomery county connects into dc's bike network yeah and so like crystal city where you can commute around crystal city just do a network of protected bike lanes and so I think, like, that's the frame of mind that we need to be thinking in. Jeremiah Lowry with WABA, thank you very much for your time and kind of getting us up to date here on where we stand as far as the cycling community in D.C. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. And after the break, we look ahead to the transit transformation our area could see with an urban planner and why he says D.C. could aim to be like Paris. Backed by the experience of its hardworking members, Steamfitters Local 602 is ready to take on your next commercial heating, cooling, HVAC, or refrigeration project. Steamfitters Local 602 adds value to our community through its partnerships with local contractors and building owners, all while keeping the focus on improving the lives of its members and their families throughout the DMV. For work that's on time and on budget, go to steamfitters-602.org to schedule your next project. That's steamfitters-602.org. Steamfitters Local 602 changing lives. Thanks for listening to the DMV Download. If you like this show, give us five stars and leave us a review on Apple Podcast. We love hearing from you guys and your reviews really do help other listeners find this, our area's only in-depth daily local news podcast. And thank you for making us a part of your day. You could call it a transit renaissance. Ever since the pandemic disrupted traffic patterns like never before, we've seen swift changes in how people choose to commute. Part of that story is an explosion in the use of bikes and a rethinking of how cities should be designed to accommodate them.
As D.C. considers changing its traffic laws, it joins others in our region who are doing everything from changing signage to adding designated bike lanes on busy roads. To understand where this could all lead, we bring in Virginia Tech professor of urban affairs and planning, Ralph Bueller. Professor, thanks for being here. So to start, let's talk about the most controversial change in this D.C. bill, which is banning cars from turning right on red. Do you think this really makes bikers and pedestrians safer? And how does it do that? Yeah, thank you for having me. It's very easy to see how it makes, especially walking, safer. If you think about yourself as a driver and you pull up to an intersection where there's a red light yeah. and you're allowed to turn right, what you're going to do is you're going to look to the left for a gap in traffic. And if you're going to look left for the gap in traffic, you're not looking right where pedestrians are crossing in front of you and you may hit the pedestrian right there. Um, on top of that, what you may also do is to see better for the traffic gap, you may actually pull into mm. the space where pedestrians are walking. So you're blocking pedestrians or you may already hit them there because you're occupied by looking left to, uh, to, to get that gap in traffic. Hmm. Right. In other words, it creates kind of a tenuous situation. And do the numbers back it up there? Is there kind of research that tracks, you know, whether it's safer? There is research and there was research pretty early on when... Uh, Right Turn on Red was, was instituted, I think, in the 70s or in the, in the early 80s, and, mm -hmm. and it showed that there was a negative effect, especially on pedestrians, but also on, on cyclists. Mm. And so moving on to a second proposed change, it's called Idaho Stops. And basically what that means is a biker or cyclist can treat a stop sign or a red light as a yield sign so they could roll through if they see that it's clear. Now, in my mind, I think, wow, well, what if they're wrong? <laughs> you know, like, what if that... What if they don't see something and could that create a dangerous situation? So could you explain to us why this Idaho stop may actually be safer for bikers, if at all? It's called Idaho stop because the state of Idaho was first to, to, to implement that. Ah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> and now there are other states like Delaware has implemented something similar just uh, for stop signs, not for the red traffic signals. And they, they call it the Delaware stop. So there may be some competition <laughs> now on the, on the terminology. It. And all of the studies I've seen that looked at the implementation of these of these policies, either with the red light or just for the stop signs, have showed no effect on safety or improved safety mm. um, for cyclists. So that I think the discussion is not that it would become less safe, but it would stay the same or it would become safer. Um, there are a couple of, of theories on why that why that would happen or how that how that could happen. Um, one of the theories is that cyclists currently do not like the neighborhood stopping at every stop sign so every block by law you stop you sort of put a foot on the ground and you start again that's very hard on cyclists and one theory is that several cyclists are avoiding neighborhood streets because they don't want to stop at every stop sign oh. so they are on the main street or on a street where there's more traffic and where it's more dangerous and they may revert back mm. with the idaho stop to the um, to the neighborhood streets where they can where they can ride bikes or where they can cycle but definitely, there's no fear of making it making it less safe by implementing these laws, at least from the studies that I've seen. So zooming out um, from these specific rules that could become law this fall, we're turning our gaze to Vision Zero, which is a D.C. program that was started back in 2015. I and mean, it has the goal to reduce traffic deaths to zero, hence the name Vision Zero. But it's come under a lot of criticism recently as, you know, people continue to be hit and uh, pedestrians and cyclists uh, are dying on our streets. What is your assessment of Vision Zero? And do you think it, it is or is not working? So for Vision Zero, I think we have to take a step back. Vision Zero came out of Sweden, out of Europe. And the idea of Vision Zero was, of course, having the long-term goal of zero fatalities, but it was sort of a, a culture change in how we plan for traffic and how we engineer facilities. Hmm. Whenever we do something, safety is the top priority, and we have to think about all users. Uh, my impression is that in, in the US, but also in, 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 in DC, the focus was very much on this, on this zero, and getting to that zero as fast as possible. But that's the long-term goal. What we need in the shorter term is safety be the priority in everything we do around traffic. And in many ways, this would be a proactive approach. So everything we do now centers on safety. A lot of what has been done so far has been reactive because we have so many dangerous intersections. We have so many dangerous spots. Yeah. So we've been trying to fix those. But I don't think we have achieved yet this, this culture change in engineering and in planning around traffic that everything we do has safety as its top priority. Mm. In other words, kind of like a Band-Aid technique rather than a total restructuring. Yes. And, and of course, the, the Band-Aid technique is, is more doable, is more feasible in, in the short run. I mean, we're talking about changing the culture of traffic engineering and of transport planning. Mm. And people have been doing it a certain way for decades 
And now we have to change how we think about safety and we have to maybe look at rules and regulations that we had in the past that were sort of what we always did and they're not safe. Mm. And, and that's, a, that's a very difficult process. When you're planning something like this, is it hard to kind of serve two masters because there's this biker versus uh, driver mentality? The drivers, of course, want to turn right on red and they're going to be a little bit annoyed by this. And the cyclists are saying, hey, what's two seconds of your day if I can safely make it through the intersection? Um, I'm not trying to speak broadly for everybody, but I think those are those are issues that are being considered. How hard is it when you're trying to make things safer to make people happy? <laughs> we have to get away from this uh biker versus pedestrian versus transit user versus driver. We want to make the streets safer for everyone. And increasingly, with the increase in cycling, in, in walking, and hopefully transit users coming back in DC, we are seeing more and more multimodal individuals. What that means is people who drive, but they are also pedestrians, they're also cyclists, and they're also transit users for other trips. Mm-hmm. Or they know people who walk, who walk to school, who walk to work, they know people who ride transit, they know people who ride a bike. And we have to come together around safety again to make it safer for everyone. So this sort of tribal thinking about I'm a driver and I want everything. I'm a cyclist and I want everything. That's not going to lead us lead us anywhere. We have to think about safety for everyone. And if we think about ourselves, more likely we are everyone because we are pedestrian, cyclist, Mm -hmm. driver and transit users in different times of the day and different times of the week. Mm. And we've been talking about, you know, changing or changes to this kind of culture of transit in D.C. And that's kind of playing out now in this discussion, this spirited discussion debate over Upper Beach Drive and whether to change this street to a pedestrian only byway. Now, this portion of this road up in Rock Creek was changed to pedestrian only byway back when the pandemic started. And now the National Park Service is planning to kind of roll that back a little bit. What are the advantages to a pedestrian-only byway, and is that a sustainable option? Again, we are talking about a a culture change. So Mm. for many, many decades in the U.S., cities and states have prioritized the car. And so we have designed cities around the car, and we have designed parks around cars and everything around cars. And we are rolling that back a little bit. This doesn't mean that there is is a war on cars, but what's going on is that we are sort of taking back some of these huge subsidies and advantages that drivers have gotten over the, over time. And a part of that is the discussion about the, the Rock Creek Park. And I think there are big advantages of having a, a natural park in the city where pedestrians, cyclists, inline skaters, hikers can relax without traffic running through it. And there is big demand for it. We've seen that in the comments that were submitted to the National Park Service. And we've seen that in, in, in the usage of the park. And Mm -hmm. I think there's something like 8,000 cars or something a day uh, going through there. And we just have to find a different way of moving those individuals uh, to where they need to go. But I think taking back some of the space that we have given to cars over the last 70, 80 years um, is feasible and is is a great benefit for for society having that in, in, in the park. Um, D.C. lawmakers, when it comes to Beach Drive, have said, you know, it's really an interesting case study because it closed over COVID. There was so much else we were concerned about, not, you know, our commute to work that we weren't even taking at that point, that it really, as far as a culture change, eased it in. People got used to the fact that it was closed and found other ways around. And now they kind of are like, oh, well, I, I already know my way around it. So it's not a big deal that it's closed. So it, it's interesting that it, it kind of snuck in there really and is and fewer people i think have an aversion to it remaining closed than would if it had happened outside of the pandemic yeah and we've seen that with other things with the pandemic all these these street eateries like we have restaurants where yeah. there used to be parking spots or we have mm. closed streets for traffic it's something we just we just couldn't imagine and covid as bad as it is and there are many many negative side effects of it has been able to show us what it would be like if there wouldn't be cars and if we would use these spaces differently and so in, in some way, COVID has, has, has helped the side effect of opening up the realm of possibilities uh, for spaces that are, that are car free. And so you're, you're fully right in your, in your description. And Professor, you've studied urban planning and city design all over the world. When you think about D.C., is there a city, possibly in Europe, I'm just guessing there, that <laughs> it looks like we're headed in the direction of? That's kind of a case study that we're moving towards? It's difficult to compare the cities in the U.S. with European cities, because U.S. cities have allowed the car to dominate the transport system so much more mm. than, than European cities. Uh, but if you want to shoot really high, you can compare D.C. to, to Paris, France. But that's a, a high a high bar, because Paris in the last 10, 15 years has really promoted walking, cycling and transit, has been very successful at reducing driving and increasing 
the livability of the city uh, and giving space back to people and taking it from cars. I was going to ask that because part of D.C., at least downtown D.C., was modeled after Paris when Lafayette was laying it out. So I wonder if there's a lot of, you know, ingenuity that Paris has used that we could look to as far as, you know, making circles more pedestrian friendly or I don't know. And D.C. is, 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 is pretty. It's, it's a beautiful city, like like the city of Paris. It has a river running, running through it. And Paris had given this, all sorts of spaces to, to to cars. And just last year, they took the Rue de Rivoli, which is next to the Louvre in, in, in downtown Paris. And uh-huh. they had four lanes of car traffic and they closed it. There's one lane of car traffic and the rest is cyclists, pedestrians and, uh, and scooter users. So they wow. took a, a highway that was along the river, sort of blocking the city from using the river and turned it into this Paris plage, they call it Paris Beach. You can't swim in the river yet. It's, it's <laughs> dirty. Uh, an exam, also comparison to DC. You right, exactly. You can't really Potomac. swim in the Potomac yet. But <laughs> it's, again, the, the point is many cities around the world are going that route as DC is, and Paris may be a little bit ahead yeah. of where DC is at the moment. Well, Professor Ralph Bueller, thank you for entertaining us and telling us about this topic and discussion of urban planning. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, so before we go, we all know malls are kind of going by the wayside, especially yeah. in our area. Um, Maza Gallery at Friendship Heights, which is actually just outside of our studios. A stone's throw away. A stone's throw um, right on Wisconsin Avenue, which used to have like a ton of stuff. Yeah, it had some clout. It, had, it was a hallmark of um, this little area. Yeah, it's obviously it's been losing stores for years. Yep. It officially closed. Um, and we just got a kind of an update on it. Tishman Spire is a developer who who has it, who bought it. They are kind of releasing like a new, these new pictures of what it's going to look like. And basically it's retail on the bottom. Okay. And then seven stories above is all going to be apartments, townhouses, cool indoor courtyards, um, but 325 units and 15% wow. of those are affordable housing. Wow. Um, it's unclear. The big question, which my mom would ask is, is the TJ Maxx going to remain open there? <laughs> well, that's like the only part that still has a pulse. It is. It yes, is. Everything and thank else, God. Everything else is closed. <laughs> and there is no, no one knows is the answer. Oh, man. Also, no one knows when it's going to be demolished. Exactly. Right. It's they I, just said sometime this year. I will shed a small tear when that day happens. Because when I was in grade school and high school, that's where I went. I'd run around Maza Gallery. You know, <laughs> like I'd catch that a movie. That was your stomping ground. Totally. I'd catch like a movie in the AMC theaters like all the way at the top it was so cool you'd ride these kind of scary escalators like they were like just suspended (laughs) mid-air you go up the escalators you know maybe you're racing with your friends or something like that very specific memory from your teenage days in maza gallery well all the days would start in mcdonald's you get a mcflurry maybe some (laughs) some nuggets of course you um and then you just walk around with your friends and try to figure out stuff to do i remember the biggest get would be to sneak into the display cases and just like pretend to be in the dis- display cases, you know, with like all the furniture and stuff and then see if anyone noticed and scurry out. But no, it was just a place to run around. I mean, yeah. that's what malls were for like our parents were just like, yeah, go there, you're safe. You know, it's right. like whatever. Right. We all and, were there uh, in our teenage years or most of us at least. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that McDonald's was great. So I guess it's not going to be like a hole in the ground because they're going to keep the parking below, but they're going to just going to kind of lop it off right at yeah. ground level and yep. demolish it. So if you hear a big Boom, that's probably that's what it is. what it is. Well, we need more housing, so that's good. That's true. And that'll do it for us today on the DMV Download. And we're sponsored by Steamfitters Local 602. Our managing editor is Craig Schwab, and our music is by Real World. Leave us a review and rate our show if you get the chance. And check out our new YouTube page, which we just created and is pretty awesome. Um, and follow us on social media where we post content from behind the scenes of the show. You can become a VIP listener at dmvdownload.com. Also, while you're doing all those things, subscribe to the podcast so you never miss a show. This podcast is a product of WTOP News. Listen on 103.5 FM in the D.C. area, 107.7 FM in Virginia, 103.9 FM in Frederick, Maryland, online at WTOP.com, and on the WTOP News app. Have a good one and see you tomorrow.